I'm Martha DeGrasse, and today's webinar topic is Wireless Infrastructure Services, Engine of Economic Growth. I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists for today. I'm joined by Matt Glass. He is Executive Vice President at Nexius, and Nexius is one of our sponsors today. NBC is also one of our sponsors today, and I'm joined by Tom Kane, President of NBC. Ron Deese, founder and president of Telforce Group, is also here today. Telforce is a leading staffing agency serving the telecommunications industry. And Rich Carlson is here representing Information Age Economics. Today, we will give an overview of the economic impact and job creation potential of wireless infrastructure spending in the United States. We'll follow that with a brief look at the carrier's different approaches to wireless infrastructure deployment, and then a discussion of the role of professional services firms, integrators, and turf vendors in this process. Then we'll hear from two of these companies, our sponsors, Nexus and NBNC. Following that, we will discuss the site acquisition process, as well as network densification through DAS and small cells, the intense demand for tower climbers, and new technologies that have the potential to increase efficiency at the cell site. After that, we will take two or three questions from the audience, so please use your control panel to send your questions if you have them. I'd like to take just two minutes to quickly introduce you to RCR Wireless News and our sponsors for today. RCR Wireless News is a premier news source for the wireless communications industry. We cover carrier, distributor, network, handset, and mobile content news. Follow us on the internet at rcrwireless.com and on Twitter at RCR Wireless News. Nexius delivers end-to-end -end wireless services to leading carriers and business intelligence solutions to data-driven industries. Services offered include network deployment, network engineering, technology services, and network and business intelligence solutions. Nexius is a Deloitte Technology Fast 50 company and has delivered double-digit compound average growth rates for the past 12 years. NBNC is network building and consulting, offering site development engineering and construction. Site development services offered include program management, site acquisition, land use services, and construction management. Engineering services offered include civil engineering, structural engineering, graphic design, and post-construction inspection. Construction solutions offered include antenna and line installation, wireless site construction, and tower top testing. And technical solutions offered include base station upgrades, installation and commissioning, testing, and troubleshooting. I'd also like to introduce you to Field Dailies, one of our sponsors who could not be here today. Field Dailies is a software platform that facilitates field reporting and expedites the closeout process. It allows crews to transmit data in real time, and it enables data analytics. And Telforce Group is also here today. As we mentioned, Telforce is a leading provider of human capital for the wireless industry, has been serving the telecommunications industry for 30 years, and is a Native American in B&E. So we're going to begin with an overview of the economic impact and job creation potential of wireless infrastructure spending. PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association, has commissioned a report on this topic, and we are joined today by one of that report's authors, Rich Carlson. Rich, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, my pleasure, on behalf of my fellow authors. So um, if we can go to the next slide, what we found is um, annual investments in wireless broadband infrastructure to the tune of 34 to $36 billion actually have an outsized impact on the economy, resulting in um, cumulative GDP growth of an estimated $1.2 trillion with a T dollars, as well as up to 1.2 million jobs. And that's because wireless, uh, the wireless broadband infrastructure industry is not just any industry. It's an industry that punches above its weight because of both direct impacts and indirect impacts of, of laying these rails. And what we found is that wireless broadband is an enabling technology, much like the electricity or the railroad, and that investments have a bigger than, than expected impact because they create the avenue for other economic actors to create um, economic value once the enabling technology expands and reaches a critical mass. Martha, next slide, please. And what you see is the wireless broadband over the next five years is reaching that critical mass. It's going from 82% to a projected 93%. And when this happens, and when the industry spends $35 billion, 
it has both direct and indirect impacts. So if you look at the middle, middle row, the 35 billion expenditures create a lot of economic activity directly in and of themselves. So when my fellow panelists are leading the charge on bringing cell sites to rural areas, uh, and that's unleashing a lot of economic activity. Tower crews are getting hired. Um, when the crews are installing cell sites, they're eating lunch at different places, they're buying gas, et cetera. And so those would be the direct impacts of, uh, of the $35 billion of, um, of CapEx. And that gets, gets multiplied by approximately 2.5 times and leads to um, GDP impacts uh, ranging from 85 to 87 billion, which you see also in, in the, middle, um, the middle part of the slide there. So if you look at this, what you see is that um, the direct impacts of wireless broadband are, are about one third the, the benefits. The indirect benefits that occur now that wireless broadband has kind of passed this 80% threshold are even, are, are even more profound. So that you have um, all kinds of different new technologies that weren't possible a couple years ago, ranging from you know, machine to machine or mobile payments, mobile entertainment, that are only possible because these rails have been laid. And if you think about, no, Rich, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you just back give us a little information about how you derived the the roughly thirty to thirty three billion a year? Um, how, how those numbers were were pulled out of public reports? Sure, um, we we did a couple different things. Um, what we did is we looked at the um, the capex that the carriers are spending, the multiple network operators, and then what we did is we also looked at capex that um, other industry actors like tower companies are expending and then uh, and then looked at data for North America as a whole and then teased out um, the, the CapEx from Canada uh, resulting in a estimation of about um, 35 billion for for the US wireless infrastructure CapEx. Okay, thank you. Are we ready for the next slide? We are. So um, what, we, what we concluded is that when you sum up these um, direct results of, um, of the economic activity due to the $35 billion in CapEx, you, you can translate the GDP gains into job creation. And what you see is that if you look at um, the tower crews being hired, the uh, manufactured employees from this $35 billion CapEx, that would be the first row, and those are, are direct impacts. And then you look at the induced job creation from the expansion of, of um, cell sites and the, the new equipment. That would be the second row. And you see that those are pretty sizable in that if, if the industry just did that, it would be a pretty powerful industry. But um, then when you look at the innovation-related creation from the technologies that we looked at, um, ranging from mobile payment to M to M to mobile product productivity and entertainment, you see um, very sizable job gains over the five-year period. And remember, this is a um, two things. These are net new jobs. So anytime you have technology disruption, there are winners and losers. But ultimately, this industry produces more winners than losers. And then secondly, these are fairly sizable job gains when you're, when you're looking at an economy that right now is producing maybe 200 net new jobs per month. So to conclude, um, our study basically finds that this is a, a very important industry that actually um, punches well, well above its, of its weight and um, is going to have a fairly profound impact on the economy over the next five years due both to from direct economic benefits but also from the from the more interesting and even larger um, indirect benefits that once the rails are laid and as um, broadband penetration 
uh, approaches 90%, um, entrepreneurs are free to innovate and do things like um, new applications in M Health, um, just about every aspect of, of the economy. So this is this investment is very important, and um, all Americans will benefit from it over the next several years. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> Now we'd like to get a little more granular and talk about the different approaches that the carriers take to this wireless infrastructure investment. This is a broad brushstroke. The carriers will at times deviate from these approaches, but in general, these are the most common approaches from the largest four carriers here in the U.S. Verizon Wireless is known for working directly with subcontractors through regional market managers. So a region might be a major metropolitan area and the market manager there will find the subcontractors to, ha to handle the various aspects of a site deployment, the site acquisition, the network engineering, logistics construction. Each aspect is likely to have a discrete subcontractor and Verizon has a reputation of returning over and over again to the same set of subcontractors. So companies that have a very positive relationship with Verizon have a very nice asset there. AT&T takes a different approach. The carrier also tends to divide the country into regions, but AT&T assigns a company to handle each region, and these are the turf vendors who in turn hire the subcontractors. And major turf vendors include companies like Nexius, who is here today, like Mostec, Walk and Beach, Goodman Networks, Bechtel, and all of these companies are covered in an upcoming wireless infrastructure company overview, which RCR Wireless will be publishing within the next few days. So you can look for that on our website. Now, Sprint and T-Mobile take a similar but slightly different approach, at least in recent times with their LTE rollouts. They have tended to work through the original equipment manufacturers, the OEMs. So they turn to companies like Ericsson, Alcatel, Lucent, Samsung, NSN, who are supplying them the network equipment. And these companies also manage the process for them. So they handle many of the functions that perhaps a turf vendor would handle for AT&T. One thing that we learned in researching this was that all of the carriers have in recent times begun to ask their contractors and their subcontractors to self-perform more parts of wireless infrastructure deployments. Carriers are keeping a closer eye on the job and asking for a more direct accountability from one or two sources instead of spreading to a number of sources. And a lot of this has to do with the intense competition to bring new sites on air faster. It's easier for the ultimate client to have one point of contact. So with that quick background, we're now going to turn to, to Nexius. Matt, are you ready? I am. Can you hear me, Martin? I can. Perfect. So just a minute or so on Nexius uh, before we get into the meeting of the panel. Uh, as you can see, Nexius has a broad range of, of what we call skill sets. Uh, we believe uh, the makeup of our skill sets, what we would call our intellect, the sum total of our skill sets. We believe our intellect makes us a unique organization. Um, we see programs from, from several different perspectives. Uh, this call will be focused mainly on the network solution slide on the left half of this slide, uh, and mainly underneath that on the network deployment uh, division. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, Nexius uh, does work directly for all the major carriers in some form or other. So we are familiar with uh, the different contractual makeups and the different contractual cultures existing. Uh, uh, some of our, our pedigree, which is interesting, I think, to, to bring up on a call about the company, is that while I don't use the word turnkey very often, because as all of us know, turnkey is probably the most overused word in the industry, maybe every industry. What I will tell you is that we think it's unique that Nexus has actually uh, worked on the front end through the technology group, worked on the front end of the carrier technology, technology planning, uh, network network uh, planning, all the way through off design, all the way through site development, into network and uh, installation migration, on into optimization, uh, through on air and optimization. So I think as far as end to end goes, we have a, a unique play. Um, inclusive of RAN backhaul and the core elements of the network as well. Uh, our, our, our main business is the uh, telecom carriers. Um, however, we do also we do also work, work for the uh, cable companies and as well as playing the, in the uh, in the enterprise. I think Rich Rich Carlson mentioned earlier uh, a lot of a 
lot of uh, areas of growth outside of traditional traditional telecom. Um, I think every industry we're finding every industry has a, has efficiency in use uh, for technology or for data play. Um, so that's pretty much our next case. Again, we're going to focus on the left half of the of the uh, of the slide deck, which is a solution slide. We'll save uh, uh, big data analytics and in cloud cloud services, whatever call. Thank you, Martha. Thank you very much, Matt. Now we're going to hear from Tom Kang with NBNC. Martha, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I sure can. Fantastic. Okay, next slide, please. It's a great. Uh, thanks for having uh, NBNC on the uh, on the webinar today. So. Um, as you can see from the slide, we're proud of a 30-year history in wireless site development. Uh, we're one of the uh, longest-standing firms in, in uh, site development in the wireless industry in the United States. Uh, I've been at the company uh, 17 years and currently function as the president. Um, we are organized into three three business units uh, to serve our customers: site development, engineering services, and construction and technical. Um, or, civil, structural, and site design. Uh, as you can see there from the slide, uh, we have over 300 uh, employees, and we specifically and strategically focus on the eastern seaboard of the United States so that we can provide a very acute uh, and local service offering uh, for, our, for our customers. Um, we are fortunate to enjoy long-standing and current workload with uh, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, as well as certain cable operators and all the major tower companies. Thanks, Martha. All right, thank you very much, Tom. We're gonna to turn now to the site acquisition process, the first part of the network deployment process. And I think that we have heard recently that as much as communities may find it difficult to, to work with companies that want to develop cell towers in their area, they also recognize the, the need for more coverage and more capacity for mobile communications. So Matt, I know you've had some experience there. Can you start this part of the discussion off for us? Sure. I think, I think in general, um, you know, the, the, the towers have gotten no prettier over the years. There is stealth technology. And uh, I think we utilize stealth as much as we can, uh, but I think I think it's it's fair to say we have the, the towers are not the most physically uh, appealing things. However, I think when you balance that against the the, the life changing uh, efficiencies brought forth by our industry, I think I think communities, if we get the right message out, and my organization, Tom's organization, several others that are on this call and probably several listening. I've all gone to a zoning board or a local community meeting and talked about the benefits of having of having better better access, better coverage, uh, ability to send data. There's certainly an email on one uh, compliant to all this. So I think I think in general the story has gotten better. While we haven't gotten any 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 better with finding uh, unique ways to, to to house our equipment in a way that is that's physically more appealing, I think the it's almost becoming uh, a necessity for communities um, uh, to be able to be attractive in business and also from a, uh, from several other perspectives, quality of life. I think it's, it's, it's certainly a necessity at this point. Okay, great. Now, Ron, what are you hearing from your clients about the site acquisition process? Um, well, you know, like Matt said, that that's the first part of the process. And site acquisition is really local where you really have to have experts who have relationships with the local town officials to be able to acquire, you know, leases for, for, for new locations. And uh, uh, so, you know, as you said, it's, it's the first uh, step in the process and it's the most critical in order to get that site that, uh, that the carriers need to be able to uh, enhance their networks. Great. And, and Tom, I know that that NBNC prides itself on negotiating directly on behalf of its clients. Can you talk a little bit about, about the site acquisition negotiation process and uh, the zoning issues also that can come up that may need to be negotiated? Sure, Martha, happy to weigh in. So, uh, you know, very interesting uh, for me watching um, the changes in site acquisition over over my career um, at NBNC. Um, the jobs become a lot more challenging than the mid-90s when I started. Um, um, 
really uh, it becomes a lot harder to staff these jobs uh, because for, from a project management level and the field level, um, you know, we can all remember, those of us who have been around for a while, remember the days of rural builds or very large search rings with multiple candidates and, and towers with, you know, one, one tenant sitting there waiting for you. And uh, the reality of that is, is those, those days are long gone. Um, our site acquisition specialists, and, and, and I know it, Nexius and other companies are really, they, they really have to be much more well-versed, uh, more well-rounded, more uh, prepared to problem solve. Um, many times these, you know, right now the wave is LTE fill-in. I mean, we have some rural builds happening, but the wave today that we're going to experience over the next couple of years in the site acquisition process is now that LTE is being lit. We're having significant coverage gaps, which we anticipated, but it's certainly very interesting watching them come out and how these you know, the search ring needs are coming out from the carriers. And they're, as, as you can imagine, they're small, they're very targeted. Uh, you have very often loaded towers that are problematic from a CapEx standpoint um, that may be there, but they're already, uh, they've got hair all over them and uh, the structurals aren't working. So you have to come up with some other alternatives. Uh, so really, and, and then um, the carriers have by their very nature grown so much over the years and become much larger organizations. Um, because of that, the size of the organizations they've had to be more uh, risk averse and, and be more bureaucratic. So the amount of due diligence and process and paperwork that we, we in the industry and the field side have to go through to complete a site now is just dramatically different than even five years ago and certainly, you know, almost a different industry than 15 years ago. Um, so in addition to being a deal maker, if you're a site acquisition person and someone that can convince someone to sign a piece of paper, you have to be a pretty good manager as well. And you have to be pretty good at reporting, giving realistic dates to your client about when things are going to be completed, and convincing that landlord to, to sign the paper. Uh, you match that up with the zoning challenges that, that were just alluded to by, uh, by Matt and, and by Ron. And you know that 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 side of our puzzle has not got gotten any easier either. And you know you have to one day be a, a, a mini lobbyist in front of a zoning a administrator to to uh, get the um, best op application process for your client to you know being ready for a zoning hearing at seven o'clock at night where you have. You know, 50 residents that aren't that aren't very happy with you or your proposed installation into the municipality. So, um, site act is a very very difficult job out there right now, um, compounded by some recent industry um, trends of uh, lower and lower fees for the results. Uh, well, I think the you know a little bit self serving, but I think the job has gotten harder. And so you compound that with some, some trends and trying to minimize carrier uh, CapEx expenditures towards the site acquisition process. And, you know, we had a few years in there where um, I, th I think it was really challenging in the, in the industry. Today, there's tremendous amount of work out there. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, Rich's slides were very telling. We're certainly seeing that on a daily, daily weekly basis with the, with the clients. So because of that, um, really the... The site acts, experienced site acts right now, and site act project managers are, are very valuable. Okay, thanks, Tom. Now, you brought up an interesting point, multi, multi-tenant multi towers, and then on top of that, I think many towers have multiple um, layers of technology on them as, as the generations have been added on. So uh, I was wondering if maybe Matt or Ron, one of you could, could speak a little bit about that before we move on and about you know the particular challenges that that may be presenting right now. So Martha, I think Matt could probably answer that better from a, uh, a construction standpoint versus a staffing standpoint. Sure. So, so I will say that that they, we are there are some networks that are that are being de demobilized. Um, you know, with, along with um, the, the new uh, the new LTE builds, uh, there are 
some of the networks are being shut down, which is good. It helps relieve some of the, the loading on the towers. And uh, but you've got to remember, you have, when you add in to your point, Martha, you may, you, if you have a GSM technology along with old CDMA technologies, now you're doubling up on LTE technology. Uh, those are one thing. Uh, and then when you think about uh, the structural uh, integrity of the tower, you add in things like backhaul. A microwave is a, is a popular, if not if not a key source of backhaul, then certainly a redundant source of backhaul for the carrier. So. Uh, and if you if you know anything about the structural integrity of towers, wind loading is as much as a problem as weight loading. So the fact that a dish is five, ten, three, maybe even ten, maybe even twelve foot in uh, in diameter puts a lot of structural stress on these towers. Uh, we've seen a, a lot of what we call modification uh, work over the last two years. I think that's going to continue. Even though we are removing equipment, we're adding more every time we remove. And uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, structural requirements are becoming more stringent as uh, as as, uh, as wind capacity picks up in general. So what I'll say is that I think yes, uh, the structural integrity of towers is, is becoming a problem as we add multiple technologies uh, and then multiple radios uh, onto our, onto an existing cell site tower or what have you. Um, structural integrity is a big big issue, which leads to, as Tom said, more sites or structural modifications to the existing tower. There's a lot of that business these days. Okay, thank you. So one way, obviously, to, to combat some of these challenges is network densification. Uh, DAS and small cells, I think, are an increasingly important part of the business for both Nexius and in BNC. Tom, can you start us off with um, a little bit of commentary on, on your DAS and small cell business? Sure thing. Thanks. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty exciting out there, honestly. Um, in in the uh, carrier landscape about what's what's coming, um, there's definitely a pivot happening on their side on um, what, what they're, many people are calling HetNet heterogeneous network design, include you know, macros, um, outdoor gas, indoor gas, and, and, and uh, small cells. Um, so what we're seeing, um, you know, gas has been very hot the last several years. Um, Outdoor has come in kind of some waves, um, big wave prior to the proposed T-Mobile and AT&T merger, and then that kind of put some some breaks there for a while on on outdoor. But then that that is now being uh, deployed pretty heavily, and certainly in the markets and the carriers we're seeing. Indoor is absolutely huge right now. Uh, just the need for um, 4G level uh, data service. Um, and, you know, not only, you know, we hear a lot about the stadiums and the uh, convention centers, et cetera, but certainly just regular uh, commercial office environments. So all the uh, either looked at or lit up um, from an indoor gas um, standpoint. So there's a tremendous amount of capex heading in that direction. And, um, Again, small cells are incredibly exciting. Um, what I would describe the small cell situation as right now is, is very, uh, very early stage. Um, a lot of conceptual uh, design and organizational and capex um, conversations happening at the carrier level. And we have, we have some carriers uh, pushing out small cells now uh, in in uh, 2013 for development, and we see other carriers in you know significant planning, uh, RFP mode, conversation mode, capex planning, and um, they're very much needed. Um, as Rich pointed out in, in one of the first slides in this webinar, uh, some of the uh, the penetration that is forecasted from now through 17 is, is significant. Um, the macro network can't necessarily do it. Um, the user need on, on a street level is is they still you know we're, we're moving towards users demanding that that 4G you know uh, almost as ubiquitous as the carriers can and, and we in the industry can deliver it. So. Um, it's needed. It's going to be needed for the data traffic. It's going to be needed for the carriers to support the consumer demand. 
and again, right now, some of the things we're seeing are that the carrier challenges around how does that op, how does that small cell operate in a broader um, macro network, and and how do the handoffs work, and is that functional? And that will be a good user experience, and then and then the um, the expenditure piece and the the return on investment piece. You know, what it, what does it really take to deploy? You know, from a capital and a manpower perspective and a timeline perspective, you know, if you forecast 100 small cells in a city in a dense urban environment, really, what is that going to take? Because to be honest, no one's really done that much volume yet. And certainly with the new equipment coming out, and new planning coming out, no one can really point to a model that is that is proven. So um, while there are challenges, there are exciting challenges to be solution providers uh, on, the, on the consulting side, uh, to be resource providers on the staffing and, and infrastructure developer side, and on the carrier side to, to be you know, leaders in your respective carrier offices to figure out how we can make these networks work with, with small cells being a part of it. So it's very heady times here as we head into 14 and, and with a nice you know, my opinion, a nice, uh, heavy, heavy, heavy backlog of small cells sitting right in front of us that are, by all accounts, absolutely necessary for the networks. Matt, would you agree with that? Are the carriers that you work with uh, looking at a lot more small cell deployments in the next 12 months? I, I think, you know, it's probably the last two years, every show, uh, every discussion I've had at the shows, every collaborative discussion has been about a lot around small cell, and so I uh, agree with a lot of what Tom said. I, you know, I, I kind of start. I always start by defining how I define small cell because I think everybody has a little bit different take on it. Everything outside the macro network, I would call small cell. And what I would say is that, as Tom mentioned, the the, the more mature uh, and, and and the more readily uh, available networks are the DAS and door and outdoor. Um, this is from the carrier's perspective. Um, some of the cable companies have, have launched into PPO cell Wi-Fi networks. Uh, they obviously understand their business with, with providing a service outside the home to, uh, to their customers. So, but back to the carriers, I think I think Tom hit the nail on the head. Um, fortunately for Nexius, uh, we, we, we are uh, such in tune with the technology piece of it. I think the key to having uh, Wi-Fi and PPO cell become more of a, more of a, a carrier trend uh, is waiting on the uh, the handoffs to the legacy uh, macro network, which then we get into Pico cell and different kind of mesh applications in order to do handoffs. Once those, and these are all in the all in the AT and T labs and the Sprint labs and all the carrier labs, they're they're, they're currently working on handoff technologies uh, and legacy network to small cell. These mesh networks will get better and better in a permanent way, and I think we'll see small cell. Data. Okay, great. Thanks. And Ron, are you seeing a lot of demand for, for DAS and small cell technicians? Well, we are starting to see a, a uplift in the uh, demand for that. And, and uh, you know, there's a pretty broad range there from, uh, um, you know, from education, uh, hospitality, uh, uh, hospitals, and, uh, and the new commercial buildings. And, uh, you know, with your uh, traditional uh, uh, cable contractors, and a lot of those are... Uh, your electrical contractors are winning some of those bids and then subletting back to companies such as Black Box. Uh, you know, they're going to get independent on if it's a neutral host or if it's a carrier host. Uh, so there's a few variables there, but we are seeing some uh, some activity uh, uh, certainly uh, you know centered around the DAS uh, space. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I know that the, the bulk of your activity is the demand for tower climbers, so I'd like to move into that topic now. I think that from what we're hearing, the demand for tower climbers has perhaps never been been this intense. Is that what you would say, Ron? Um, most definitely, Martha. First, thank, yeah, thank you and the RCR uh, Wireless for inviting the Teleforce to, uh, to the webinar today. And uh, you know, uh, Tom and, and Matt and Rich for, the, for their contribution. I've been uh, doing a lot of listening and taking notes here, and the uh, job well done, fellas. Uh, you know, first, uh, you know, Bellforce is a, uh, a professional services staffing company providing human capital uh, to both the wireline and wireless industry. Uh, we have three offices uh, in Nashville, Atlanta, and recently just opened in uh, Los Angeles. 
And uh, over the past uh, 30 years, obviously, I have seen the, you know, the evolution from the wireline to the wireless industry. And uh, so, um, you know, that said, uh, we'll, we'll jump right into to the tower climber. I first started uh, recruiting tower climbers back in 2003. And uh, that's whenever I moved over to uh, AFL, who was part of Alcoa Aluminum at the time. And they had just bought a couple of wireless companies, one in Atlanta, PAX 17. I'm sure some of the folks on the call today will certainly recall them, as well as Maritime out on the West Coast and Irvine. So combined, they were about a $100 million in wireless uh, uh, EF&I construction company. And uh, they had just won some fairly large contracts with um, with uh, Sprint as well as uh, Nextel when they were two separate companies. So they were kind of at a crossroads as to, you know, should they continue to use the outside staffing resources, which they were currently doing with seven or eight companies with an annual spend of about 13 to 15 million a year in staffing, or bring in and create an in-house staffing division to onboard uh, these new hires. So uh, that's when I became part of the AFL family. I went in as the uh, Vice President of Professional Services and was tasked to hire in excess of over 300 people per year. And uh, so, uh, you know, moving along with that, uh, we, we did, it, did that internally for AFL for about 15 or 18 months, and then we launched what became a commercial staffing division for revenue. And one of our first clients was uh, General Dynamics. Uh, as everyone knows, General Dynamics uh, has a large operation right there in Brentwood, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. And during a, about a six-and-a-half-year period, uh, uh, we maintained about 75 to 110 tower climbers uh, as W-2 employees on AFL's payroll. And uh, so that program, quite frankly, is still in existence today. But in addition to that, we also provided uh, uh, other large uh, uh, general contractors with tower climbers. We had in excess of 50 climbers in, in uh, Western Canada with West Tower. Uh, we provided climbers for Black and Beach, uh, Dynas, Goodman, and the other and the other companies. Um, so, you know, leading into what you're saying, Mark, it, it's no big secret that there is a very big demand for tower climbers. And without climbers that are doing the line and antenna work, uh, preparing for the other work to be done on the ground, uh, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of the projects completed or sites completed. Um, I uh, recall back in 2004, I think it was maybe 2005, uh, Wireless Estimator did a, uh, they did a survey to find out approximately how many tower climbers that were. Uh, working for within the industry and uh, the best I remember of the survey came back and said there was about 8,000 power climbers uh, working in the industry again in 2004 2005 um, and uh, as I recall Bechtel but now Beacon as well as West Tower I believe were the two largest power uh, climbers um, today, there's obviously many more larger players in the market, such as NBC, Nexus, uh, uh, you know, Telemon, uh, MozTech, and others. So, um, in looking at some of the the job openings and statistics, in a wireless estimator alone, which is a site that uh, you can place uh, free ads for job openings as well as a source for climbers. There are about, on average, anywhere between 100 and 300 companies looking for various skill sets. And when you break that down, uh, they're looking for in excess of 1,000 to 2,000 power climbers. And um, so, uh, you know, with, with that much of a demand, folks have started creating some internal uh, um, training centers. I was in Atlanta a few months ago and met with Blue Stream. And uh, they set up a very, very impressive uh, training facility to train power climbers. And right, there's yeah, many others. About that. That's great. And now let's, let's talk a little bit about um, training before we before we run out of time. Um, okay. Now, Matt, I know that that you're planning to hire a number of tower climbers in the year ahead. Can you comment on that a little bit, and also on um, where where the best sources of training are for people, in your opinion, who may not have been climbers before but who want to get into it?
Matt, can you hear me? I'm sorry, can you hear me now, Martha? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. I apologize. I was on mute. Oh, that's okay. So, so I think I think in general, if you're watching uh, Mr. Carlson's slides, um, you'll you'll note that the the industry trend and the the wireless in infrastructure growth, uh, you know that that is that is maintained by and built by power climbers. So I think I think that the supply and demand follows those trend lines with the power climbers. So uh, Nexius has uh, has in the last year, most of maybe maybe eight months, we've uh, we've got a hundred of these climate tower hundred power climbers on staff. And we'll probably go upwards of, of 300 by end of 2014. Um, we try to roughly right now we're one third. I think we'd like to be one half to two thirds. In other words, we've got uh, close to close to 300 and some power climbers uh, that are currently working for us through some type of partner companies. That's got to. If you look at the build plans of the carriers for next year, along with the overlay plans of the carriers for next year, along with the typical maintenance plans of the carriers for next year. I think that there's no way that, that we do that with the current the current power climbers that are that are in the queue. So I think I think um, if the number is 8,000, I'm not sure. But I think with it, what the number is today, it needs to double by by the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Um, and I think you I think during the, uh, a lot of the stuff I've read recently, published by RCL Wireless and others, I think that I think that that's certainly we're going well a way to do that. Now for training, there's a couple different things. There's a there's a, a there's a uh, comp train course, which is a well recognized which is a, a, a recognized course I think in the U.S. for for uh, tower climber certifications. Uh, there's also if you go to the NAPE website, uh, National Association of Tower Erectors, they are probably one of the more active groups um, for tower safety and tower climber trainings, and they've done a lot of good work in the last six to twelve months. If you look at their website with uh, different information on accredited uh, training companies around the country. Uh, for all different budgets, whether you're a mom and pop or whether you're a big company, um, I think we all have a, uh, have a similar a thread here when it comes to safety. Um, so I would say two things. I would say that that Comtrain is one of the is one of the more popular ones. However, there are others, and I would say that Nate, as a as a nonprofit organization that supports safety and tower awareness, tower safety awareness, they're one of the better groups to uh, to check out. The, the, Find yeah, I just uh, saw that they launched the the Nate Exchange with um, lots of courses online that um, that you can access, and those are really focused a lot on safety training. I think particularly. Sure. So, Matt, before we move on, we did get a question from the audience about Nexius asking if you operate only in the U.S. or outside the U.S. as well. Can you share that with us? Nexius has offices. Um, in, in mostly in the U.S., 70% of our work is in the U.S., but we are active in, uh, we've got office in Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Cordoba, Argentina, uh, Dubai, uh, London, and in, uh, in, in, uh, in Beirut, Lebanon. But most of our businesses, probably 70% of our businesses are in the U.S. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, the last topic that we're going to discuss is new technologies at the cell site that have the potential to increase efficiency and enable uh, network operators to build and maintain their sites more quickly. And Matt, I think that, that you have some ideas to share about some of the things that you've seen there at Nexius, right? Well, I think, yeah, I think, I think everybody's, uh, I think all the, all the companies represented here and all the, all the carriers and everyone in the community, I think is interested in, in getting to a more efficient model in the field. Uh, for quality reasons, for safety reasons, for efficiency reasons. So I think this started a few years ago with sweep testing. Sweep testing is when we test the cables, a very important part of a cell site, because if those cables aren't carrying a clean signal, then you're going to have problems with your, with your with your phone calls and whatnot. So it started with sweep testing, and we and there's companies like Sweep Bob, others out there that, that do a, a good job of, of keeping uh, keeping the data all electronic in the field at all times. I think that that has matured now. I think we see most of the photos being taken at the cell sites and immediately emailed into some kind of quality check and balance. And the idea is that to make things more efficient for the for the tower crews, that they don't have to. But the more times they have to climb that tower, uh, the more times they have to rig the tower and then perform all their safety checks and then and then climb the tower, the more money it costs them. And when they're working on a fixed working on a fixed price uh, service. That 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 eats into into their uh, their ability to remain efficient. So I think I think paperless systems are out there. I think there's a lot of companies out there 
uh, uh, who are providing uh, software now so that they can do uh, a lot of their quality checks from the field. And, uh, and I think you mentioned there's one earlier. Yeah, Field Dailies is one of our Thank sponsors. Thank you. I'm worried, yeah, yeah. I was struggling to remember Field Dailies. I appreciate yeah. that. Field Dailies, uh, there's a lot of software companies who are creating software that allows the field to be paperless. I think we, we all want to have a paperless field. I think it makes it more efficient. It makes it more, a more safe environment and certainly uh, allows the crews to get on and off the tower um, with, with less punch. Um, so I think I think that we're good too. I think where we're heading now is I think we all have laptops at this site. I think all of our, our, our crews have those and they're downloading forms and they're doing quality checks via laptop. The next the next level, so to speak, and next is developing some of this is is that with 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 smartphones or with uh, uh, some of the iPad technologies or the, the tablets, we're able to do a lot of the forms right there, take the photos right there, and they're quality checked real time. I think that's the next step. That's the next evolution of where we're going. In, uh, in new yeah, and that's that's that what site. the Field Daily software does. And they, I think they upload it directly, and then they, they capture that data so that they can also analyze that data later. So I think that that's maybe the next level, too. Agreed. Yeah, and this is Rich. If I can chime in, um, this is a trend that's actually um, stormtrooping field workforces in general. Uh, paper forms are being eliminated you know, on a daily basis, and there's a, a plethora of um, pretty scrappy, innovative software companies that are creating great um, workforce automation softwares that run on both smartphones and tablets. And then there's a second wave kind of following that, which is um, folks are looking at the data you know, um, at things like tower sites and, and, and um, you know, from different machines and having the machines begin to call out to the um, to central places where so that um, preventative maintenance trips can be scheduled or not. And uh, my favorite story is of a cappuccino maker that um, has data that's sent from the, the cappuccino machines back to headquarters and then the, the the retailers don't even have to do anything and then all of a sudden a technician only shows up when he or she needs to before the machine breaks and that they're losing revenues. So this is part of a, a larger trend that we uh, alluded to in this study. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, well, we are almost out of time, but we do have one more question uh, from the audience, and this is for, for both NBNC and Nexius. And the question is, what criteria should a national operator be using to assess potential vendors? Does the size of the vendor matter? So I think that's asking about, about a carrier working with a vendor. And uh, Tom, would you, would you like to take that question first? Sure, I could start. Uh... Thanks, Martha. So um, I think it really does depend on the project. I don't. I don't want to say that as I'm to, to feel I'm punting the question. But um, you, you know, all projects are different. Um, you know, what's the rollout? What's the scale? What's the carrier looking for? Um, I have seen times, obviously, where a carrier um, has you know large, massive uh, upgrade projects where it's really construction focused, it's really technology focused. There, a local knowledge maybe is not as critical to that type of project, a local knowledge base, local personnel. Uh, the carrier may need some financing or be able to float some work uh, to, a, to a big boy, so to speak, who's got a big balance sheet and carrier, you know, doesn't want to start writing checks till you know six or nine months into the project and then you know size is going to be critical because you need to scale nationally um, you need a big balance sheet you need someone that can uh, finance uh, maybe equipment finance a ton of subcontractors to to get your project done conversely and you know let's go back to one of our topics earlier where you start talking about volumes of, of, of new site builds and, and site acquisition um, as, as I believe, uh, I think it was Ron said um, earlier, um, it, it, many times it's a very local business and it's very difficult to parachute in uh, personnel from other places and have them be effective. So if, if I'm a carrier and I'm in that type of mode, if I need a lot of, uh, or worked on a, 
on a specific basis in maybe several municipalities, even if it's you know five, six, seven cities. I may go more of a strategy of you know who has the real resources in that market or markets. Maybe I go with two or three smaller vendors that can do you know the northeast. You know, one does the northeast, one does the southeast, one does Pacific Northwest because they're really set up to execute in the site design, engineering, site acquisition, zoning, really the soft cost stuff we talked about to get to NTP, so that um, the carrier can be effective that way. What we see when the carrier makes a decision and brings in a big firm to do that type of work, the failure is typically on timeline, that people are brought in that aren't prepared, they don't staff up quickly, they don't have local resources, it takes too long to staff, and there's a break rate on some of the staff, and before you know it, your, your timeline has just gone out by 20 or 30 or 40 percent on what is your longest timeline on those new site projects, which is pre-NTP. So that's my kind of quick overview of, you know, size versus, you know, maybe big versus small and some of the ways we see the carriers make those decisions in the marketplace. That, uh, excellent insight. Thank you very much. Matt, would you agree with that? What's your take? Yeah, so, yeah certainly. Um, so I think that that the operators and the carriers, I think that they, they've got to understand or they, they want to understand what your ability is. I think self-performance is not is not a, a rigid thing. It's not a, it's not 100% or zero. I think you want they, what, what the carriers want, what the operators want, what any client would want. They want the best solution, the safest solution, uh, the, the solution that has the uh, the ability to scale or or, or, uh, or be very targeted. Uh, so I think I think... When you're choosing a company, I think you have to look at a couple of things. We often talk about um, going to the local versus going to a larger regional firm or national firm. And I think I think that there's there's while there's certainly something to be gained uh, from the standpoint of probably cost by going to the local folks. I think that the carriers worry a lot about indemnification. I think carriers worry a lot about being able to be able to report and operate in these complex reporting systems that they run. And I think that's where mid-sized companies do well. Um, I think for some of the local on-call maintenance stuff, I think there's there's a there's a local play there. Uh, in general, I would say you know, it, yeah, I would say to base it on if I was if I was an operator, I'd base it on the, the size and scale of your project, the complexity of your system, and the ability of your back office to process uh, companies. Are the three factors I would look at. All right. Thank you very much. Well, we are out of time, so I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Matt Glass, Executive Vice President at Nexius. Tom Kane, President at NBNC. Ron Dees, Founder and President of Telforce Group. And Rich Carlson, who's been here representing Information Age Economics. This has been Wireless Infrastructure Services, Engine of Economic Growth, and this is RCR Wireless News. Thank you all for joining us today, and this will conclude the webinar.